It is necessary for the recording of sound to convert the sound waves to corresponding changes in light. The sound waves the sound. produced by my voice are transmitted through the air to the microphone where these sound waves are converted to changes in an electric current. These variations in the electric current are then amplified and used to control the light. This varying beam of light falling on the photoelectric cell produces variations in the electric current which are directly proportional to the variations in the light beam. The sound track. As the varying electrical current in the photoelectric cell is small, a vacuum tube amplifier is required to increase it to the point where it will operate a loudspeaker. Soundtrack. Cult Rejects. This episode, we'll kind of be doing a, uh, I guess, part two, two of the original uh, cultists in history. Um, these were uh, these were other characters that me and Lisa both had, uh, I think we were going to cover in the original one, until we realized it was already gone, long, gone on long enough, and we didn't want to turn it into uh, two and a half, three hours. So we kind of just like, well, let these uh, let these two go. But we did want to come back to them. And I think be between both of them, we'll be able to get an episode out of them anyway. But, uh, yeah, so we're back at it with a cultist from in history. Um, real quick, I'll introduce Lisa. Obviously, she's covering this with me like she did last time. Uh, what is up, Lisa? How are you? How's it going? I'm very excited to finally do this. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one and the grimoires, actually, to yes. do a part two one. I'm very excited to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, did you want to at least let everybody know if they ever want to get in touch with you, where they can find you or anything? Sure, you can find me on Twitter at Solis Lisa or Instagram at Lisa Solis. Awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, you can find her stuff also once it drops on the Cult Research Institute. <laughs> and uh, actually, by the time that this comes out, that's probably will be done. So Yeah, I think so. I yeah, I didn't. It, I, I didn't think of that. Been putting in a lot of work. Been trying. Been trying for sure. Yeah, it's gonna be great. But uh, yeah, definitely check that out. The link will be in the bottom. There'll be other stuff on there that uh, she probably has not covered on the show, but she's done in her own notes through her own research. Um. So yeah, check that out, and uh, I guess we'll get into it. Um. All right, I'm gonna get to uh my guy. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's going to be names in here that I'm going to butcher, so please bear with me. I, I'm trying my best. But uh, this is, uh, and you know, going forward into the episode, I just want to also say that, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're covering these people, I'm not going to go too deep into it, and I don't think Lisa is. It's just a little bit more of a, a history and what the person was about and maybe where they were from, you know, people they associated with. But the reason I'm bringing them up is because I do think that they may have something to offer if you look into their writings and what they talked about and what they're about. Okay. I'm not saying everything, but they might have some stuff to offer that may interest people. They might have had something of importance to say. And they were definitely connected to others as well. So oh, yeah. you see their name pop up over and over. Yep. Yep. Um, all right, so yeah, we're going to get into uh, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. I'm saying it correctly. And he was uh, the 24th of February in 1466 to the, no, the 17th of November, 1494. So man passed away on the 17th. Uh, Giovanni Pico de, and this, you know, again, I might be screwing this up. Conti della Mirandola A della Concordia. Also known as Pico della Mirandola was a uh, prominent Italian Renaissance nobleman and philosopher, and he made history at the age of 23. It was in 1486 when he astounded many by offering to, def to defend 900 theses covering religion, philosophy, natural philosophy, and magic. That's the, yeah, right. Imagine, imagine, like, somebody spending the time to even, like, read all those to defend them. 
I know. Exactly. Nowadays, like, yo, I ain't got time for that. There's TikTok to play with. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have to update my status on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this event um, led him to compose the renowned uh, oration on the dignity of man, often hailed as the uh, manifesto of the Renaissance, which I find interesting. Um, Pico's oration holds a significant place in Renaissance humanism and the Hermetic Reformation. He is credited, and this is why I thought he was also important, among other reasons, he is credited with founding the tradition of Christian Kabbalah, a p- pivotal, uh, pivotal aspect of early modern Western esotericism. The church universally banned his 900 theses upon its printing, leading some to regard Pico as a precursor to the Protestant movement due to the resemblance of these theses to certain Protestant perspectives. So uh, Giovanni was born at Mirandola near Modena. I'm saying that right. Mm-hmm. The youngest son of Gianno, uh, Gianfresco, uh, Gianfrancesco, Gianfrancesco, uh, Pico, Lord of Mirandola and Count of Concordia, and by his wife, uh, Julia, daughter of Deltrino Biardo, Count of Scandiano. Scandiano. Uh, The family had a long history in the castle of Mirandola, which gained independence in the 14th century and was granted the fief of Concordia in 1414 by the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund. Uh, The Pico della Mirandola family was closely connected to the uh, Sforza, Gonzaga, and Este dynasties. Furthermore, Giovanni's siblings married into the descendants of the hereditary rulers of Corsica, Ferrara, Bologna, and Forli, for forging strong ties across the region. So that was even another thing. I mean, you know, I think his family was also kind of maybe well off just in the situations that it was in. Yeah. You know, they're definitely, I yeah. think, connected to prominent people at the time. Born uh, 23 years into his uh, parents' marriage, which I even found that weird. Like, wow, you That's waited old. 23 years. Like, I don't know how young they were getting married then. But let's say you even got married at 20. Like, you waited to 43 to pop out another one? Oh, God, no he was way. An oops ba- he was an oops baby. Oh, yeah, I guess that, I mean. Oops. Uh, born 23 uh, years into his parents' marriage, Giovanni had uh, two much older brothers, both of whom outlived him. Count Galotto, the first, continued the dynasty while Antonio became a general in the imperial army. The Pico family would reign as dukes until Mirandola, an ally of uh, Louis Louis XIV of France, was conquered by his rival, Joseph, the Holy Roman Emperor, in 1708 and annexed to Medina, uh, by Duke Ronaldo di Este. Subsequently, the exiled male line of the family became extinct in 1747. Giovanni's uh, maternal family was renowned for their exceptional contributions in the arts and scholarship during the Italian Renaissance. His cousin and contemporary, the poet Matteo Maria Biardo, was deeply influenced by their uncle, uh, Tito Vespa, <laughs> made me think of Vespa from uh, Spaceball. Yes. Vespasiano <laughs> Strazzi. That's <clears throat> Especially like just with the whole getup and everything. I mean, they even yes. looked very Renaissance. A prominent Florentine patron of the arts and a scholar poet. Giovanni had a complex and contradictory relationship with his nephew, uh, Gian Francisco. Uh, Gian Francesco Pica della Mirandola, despite being a fervent admirer of his uncle, um, his nephew published Examen I Vinatatis Doctrine Gentium, or however you say that, mm-hmm. in 1520. He actually put that out in direct opposition to Giovanni's ancient wisdom narrative. 
So I even find that interesting that he even did have a family member that even though they got along and they admired their work, he didn't agree with some of his stuff. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. Maybe, then, maybe he was, was wrong. Putting, <laughs> yeah, and putting stuff out in direct uh, contradiction of it almost, right? Yeah, yeah. A remarkably uh, gifted and quirk, uh, quick-witted uh, young boy, Giovanni displayed an extraordinary talent for retaining knowledge and was immersed in the teachings of Latin and quite likely Greek from his tender years. His mother, foreseeing a path for him within the church, orchestrated his appointment as a papal proto-notary, if I'm saying that right, as the, at the remarkable age of 10. Jesus Christ. No time for, I mean, I guess you didn't have G.I. Joe no, or Tonka trucks. But. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting because so many people did so many things at an early age. And when I say early, I'm like 10, 12, 15, and you're like, Man, I was, Just, like, still popping pimples on my face at 15. You know what I mean? Like, no, right? Like, there's people that were, like, you know, famous artists from back in the day that it's like, you know, they started young as shit, actually. Exactly. Well, yeah. no wonder they were a badass. They had, like, mm. 20 years on everybody. Yeah, by, like, the time they were 25, they were already doing it for 15 years. <laughs> like, you know. Child labor laws be damned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, all right, where was I? Um, all right. subsequently in uh, 1477, he journeyed to Bologna with a purpose of delving into the intricacies of canon law, marking uh, the dawn of his scholarly pursuits in this field. Following the sudden demise of his mother three years later, Pico made the bold decision to forego his pursuit of canon law and instead immersed himself into the study of philosophy at the esteemed University of Ferrara. Ferrara, however you want to say it. A, uh, a fortuitous sojourn to Florence introduced him to the likes of Angelo Poliziano, the poet Girolamo Benevini, something like that, and quite possibly the youthful Dominican friar Girolamo uh, Savonarola, probably screwing these up, sorry, all of whom uh, become lifelong confidants. Um, real quick on Angelo Ambrogini, um, commonly known as Angelo Poliziano, uh, just wanted to mention him real quick, was an Italian classical scholar and poet of the Florentine uh, Renaissance. His scholarship was instrumental in the divergence of Renaissance or humanist Latin from medieval Latin and for developments in philology, the study of language in oral and written historic sources. Not that interesting. At the age of 10, uh, Politiano began his studies at Florence as the guest of a cousin. There he learned the classical languages of Latin and Greek. And from Marsilio Ficino, he learned the rudiments of philosophy. At 13, he began to circulate Latin letters. At 17, he wrote essays in Greek uh, versification. And at 18, he published an edition of Catalyst. Lorenzo di Medici, the autocrat of Florence and the chief patron of learning in Italy at the time, took Politiano into his household, made him the tutor of his children, among which were Piero, the unfortunate, and Giovanni, the future Pope Leo X. Oh, wow. So, these people were, you know, yeah. connected, I think. Very connected. Yeah, now uh, back to Giovanni. I just wanted to you know, mention somebody that he was associated with that I thought had a little bit of interesting history. From 1480 to 1482, he dedicated himself to furthering his education at the Distinguished University of Padua, which I'm sure we've mentioned before, haven't we? All the time. Almost in every single one, somebody has a connection to University of Padua. I'm telling you, that goes back to Star Wars somehow, too. <laughs> He's using that word. In, this. in addition to his uh, already proficient uh, you know, command of Latin and Greek, he undertook the study of Hebrew and Arabic under the guidance of Alea del Medigo. Del Medigo not only aided Pico in the translation of Judaic manuscripts from Hebrew to Latin, 
but also provided valuable insight into Aramaic texts. It's worth noting that the influence of Savonarella led Pico to compose sonnets in both Latin and Italian. In the uh, following four years, he dedicated his time uh, either staying at home or exploring humanist centers in various parts of Italy. By 1485, uh, he embarked on a journey to the Uver University of Paris, known as the pivotal hub in Europe for scholastic philosophy and theology. It is likely that it was during his time in Paris that Giovanni initiated his 900 theses and formulated the notion of advocating them through public debates. In the year of uh, 1494, at the age of 31, Pico met his end under mysterious circumstances, conceding with the untimely passing of his friend Poliziano. There were whispers and rumors suggesting that Pico's own secretary might have, involved, have been involved in his demise, supposedly due to Pico's growing proximity to Savonarola. In, uh, in 2007, a significant event unfolded in Florence when the remains of Poliziano and Pico were, were unearthed from a hollowed grounds of, of the Church of San Marco. The purpose behind this act was to delve into the mysteries shrouding their, ultimate, uh, their, their demise. The compelling results of thorough for forensic examinations unveiled a distressing truth. Both luminaries had likely succumbed to the insidious effects of arsenic poisoning. Oh, no. What further compounded the tragedy was the looming suspicion that the nefarious deed might have been orchestrated under the auspices of Lorenzo's hire, Piero di Medici. Wow. But I find it interesting how, I mean, it, they were both found to have been poisoned by the same thing. I mean, both poisons, maybe different things, but I mean, the same thing too. Jeez. Wow. wow. That was like, oh, we just That's figured sad. out a drug we can use that nobody can detect Yeah, now. exactly. I wonder if it was like placed in some sort of like uh, container, like a wine container. And I don't know, let's say Policiano came over for a glass of wine and they both drank out of it. Yeah. But it was only supposed to be Pico. I don't know. Casualty of war. Oh, yeah. Really. Imagine that. Imagine one yeah. wasn't supposed to be both. You know what I've also wondered well, about, what? too? Like, I wonder how many, like, alchemists back in the day were, like, the people making these things to kill kill other ones. Yeah, that's how they were making money on the side. <laughs> making I don't want to know what it is that you need it for, off, yeah. but, yeah. It's going to cost yeah. you a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Who needed a patron at that point? Yeah. All right, so now into a little bit about of, uh, Giovanni's 900 Theses. The conclusions will not be disputed until after the epiphany. In the meantime, they will be published in all Italian universities. And if any philosopher or theologian, even from the ends of Italy, wishes to come to Rome for the sake of debating, his lord, the disputer, promises to pay the travel expenses from his own funds. And that was the announcement at the end of the 900 Theses. Pico experienced two pivotal events that would shape the course of his life. The first of these occurred when he made his way back to Florence in November 1484 and encountered the influential figures of Lorenzo di Medici and Marsilio Ficino. It happened to be an astro uh, astrologically significant day selected by Ficino for our unveiling of his translations of Plato's work from Greek to Latin all of which, which was generously backed by Lorenzo. Pico's undeniable uh, charm captivated both men, uh, and despite differing philosophical uh, leanings, Ficino was swayed by their shared Saturn, Saturn connection. They both, and that's like another reason why I kind of want to get into Ficino, is yeah. that I do think uh, when it comes to cultism or even, uh, I guess, magic in a sense, his ideas, I really do think, uh, really inspired kind of like how we look at Saturn now. And like just from me slightly kind of going into some of the stuff that I've looked in with him about Saturn is that, uh, you know, again, and not saying that like, you know, I'm correct because I think this way. 
But I have, like, even said multiple times that, like, Saturn is not, like, that's like a, a swinging door that goes both ways. That is not just a death and that's it. You know, there's, there's, there's more to it. There's a death and a rebirth. Yeah. It's just the end and the beginning of another thing. And Ficino was very big on that. Then it just being, oh, you're dead. You know, death. You know, death, death, death. So almost almost like circular, like the rings of Saturn. Yes. Yeah. If you believe in rings <laughs> or round. I'm sure those are all there with their numbers and whatever they're called for. Tell you some specific story. Yeah. Um. From that day onwards, Lorenzo became Pico's unwavering supporter and protector, a bond that endured until Lorenzo's passing in 1492. Mm. Soon after his stay in Florence, Pico was traveling on his way to Rome, where he intended to publish his 900 theses and prepare for a congress of scholars from all over Europe to debate them. Stopping in Arezzo, he became involved in a love affair, with the wife of one of Lorenzo di Medici's cousins, which almost cost him his life. Giovanni attempting to run off with the woman. <laughs> oh, boy. But he was caught wounded and thrown into prison by her husband. He was released only upon the intervention of Lorenzo himself. Whew. It's like a soap opera. Right? So Pico spent several enlightening months in uh, Perugia, nearby uh, Frata, allowing his wounds to heal and his mind to wander. During this time, he came across a collection of intriguing Chaldean books, including works of uh, Esdras, Zoroaster, and uh, Melchior, if I'm saying that correct. Mm. These texts, regarded as oracles of uh, the Magi, revealed to Pico a concise yet enigmatic interpretation of Chaldean philosophy. Moreover, his fascination with the mystical Hebrew Kabbalah and the late classical Hermetic writers was piqued as they were believed to be as ancient as the Old Testament in Pico's era. Under the guidance of Rabbi Johanan Alamano, Pico delved into the study of Kabbalah where he discovered Alamano's compelling argument that the mystery of magic was the ultimate stage of one's intellectual and spiritual education. Oh, that's kind of poetic. Yeah, you know, there was even something like I wasn't going to go on to it too much to add to add to the show, but like him and like other rabbis that I found too, that like one links to that one or, you know, was influenced by this one. Yeah. I did find interesting a lot of them were all Italians. They're just fine, you yeah. know, Italian Jews. <laughs> I mean, they're yeah. rabbis, right? No, yeah, 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 they are. They are. So I like... But Italian nonetheless. Yeah. And then you find yourself one day siding with people who want to kill you. <laughs> That's very weird. <sighs> oh, on to the next. <laughs> rabbi uh, Johan Alam Alamano was an Italian Jewish rabbi, uh, noted Kabbalist, humanist philosopher, and teacher of the Hebrew language to Italian humanists, including Pico della Mirandola. He taught that Kabbalah was divine magic. This interaction, stemming from Christian curiosity about delving into the ancient te teachings present in Jewish mystical texts, led to an unparalleled unparall exchange of ideas between Jewish and Christian uh, Renaissance ideologies. Among Pico's 900 Theses, his most distinctive contributions revolved around the Kabbalah, establishing him as the progenitor of Christian Kabbalah, a significant component of, of early modern Western esoteric thought. Pico's uh, method of navigating various philosophies was, uh, was deeply syncretic, leading him to align them in a parallel manner rather than seeking to delineate a linear developmental progression. Which I even wonder if, like, to me, that's almost kind of very, like, occultist in a sense. I think so, too. Like, you're just going to look um, at, like, like, for me, like, sometimes you may not try to, like, look at the specific facts. You're just going to throw everything and just look at it and see what pops out to you. You know? Yeah. Yeah. In a sense. And then, if uh, I have a question. Like, sure. so if they called you a, a Kabbalist, 
would that be synonymous with saying today, in today's day and age, an occultist? You know, I'm... I'm just hmm. curious. I mean, I don't... I think occultist, the word occultist, gets slapped on a lot of things just due to ignorance. Gotcha. You know, I don't, I don't know how to say it in any other way. Like, no, you know, no, no. like to me, like I'm into the Kabbalah, but yeah, I'm not saying my listeners, but other people that could come across that, they'll they'll see somebody with a red bracelet on and think they're a piece of shit because they're into Kabbalah, but I'm okay because I'm talking about it. You understand right. what I'm getting at? So it seems, yeah. you know, occult yeah. or dark to other people. I don't know. It's interesting, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think, like, if it wasn't due to people being so afraid of things, I think a Kabbalist may not be considered an occultist in the, the regular sense people use that term. You know, I call myself an occultist, but I don't see anything wrong about it. Right. Because you know? <laughs> of the way I look at the right. word. Right. And here is uh, just some more pictures of the, the wonderful man right here. Didn't actually have too many slides on this guy. I will we'll get to a few more as we're going. So if you are watching, or if you're listening, you know, it's really not that big of a deal, but there will be some slides that I think are worth seeing, especially on my end. Uh, Giovanni drew inspiration primarily from Plato, echoing his mentor Marcello Ficino's reverence for the philosopher. Nonetheless, Pico's inclination towards eclecticism and his profound respect for Aristotle set him apart. Demonstrating a balanced approach, he sought to counteract the extremes of pure humanism while advocating for the merits of medieval and Islamic scholars like Averroes and Avicenna. In a notable communication to Imarlo Barbaro, Pico wanted to harmonize, and I find this interesting, Pico wanted to harmonize the teachings of Plato and Aristotle viewing them as conveying identical notions through different terminology. That's interesting. I think that goes on. I mean, you know, maybe he's wrong there. I don't, you know, whatever. But I do think that goes on a lot with just all these other types of symbolism. I do too. It's just a different flair too. on saying the same shit. Well, they want to set themselves apart, so they... Oh, I'm the, I, we're the true answer. Terminology mm. or symbology that sets them apart, but... Uh, Pico emphasized the importance of studying Hebrew, Talmudic sources, and Hermeticism alongside conventional teachings, perceiving them as alternate but coherent expressions of the divine as encapsulated in the Old Testament. Now, I do find this interesting. I wonder, you know, like the Kabbalah that I'm into, or more into studying with technically, and I, I really should specify it, but I forget, would be more of the Hermetic Kabbalah, which has all these other associations added to it. Like, I, I could probably talk to somebody who was, like, really actually Jewish and into Jewish Kabbalah, and they might even mm -hmm. say the Kabbalah I'm into is, like, fucked up, and, like, they're, they're like, I have no idea where this is coming from. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Because it has, like, yeah. all these associations. So, like, I even wonder... Um, was, was he even an influence to adding, putting that hermetic, you know, add oh, to the tree of life? Ah, yeah. yeah. I could Just wondering, that. you know what I'm saying? Because of him saying yeah. that, you know. Um, he completed his oration on the dignity of man to complement his 900 theses and uh, journeyed to Rome to advance his endeavor of defending them. In December of 1486, he consolidated them into a publication entitled uh, Conclusions Philosophiae Kabbalisticae at Theologicae. One thing I did find interesting about that is that you do have three words in a row with A-E, A-E. Well, then you have et, and then A-E again. You know, very much like yeah. Aeon, A-E-O-N. I just, yes. you know, wondered if I found that interesting and extended an offer to cover the expenses of any scholars who ventured to Rome to engage in public debates over them. Eager for the discourse to commence on the Feast of Epiphany on 6th of January, a date symbolizing the submission of pagan gents to Christ, Pico aimed for a victory that would signify not only the symbolic acceptance of the pagan sages, but also the conversion of Jews upon recognizing Jesus as the true secret of their traditions. In February of 
Pope Innocent VIII put a stop to the proposed debate. Despite Pico addressing the accusations against them, 13 theses were deemed unacceptable. Pico did not consent in writing to retract them, but staunchly maintained their validity. In the end, all 900 faced condemnation. <laughs> Imagine it was like, yo, all I got to do is change those 13. I mean, still, that's a little screwed up still. You know, he's still yeah, being controlled. Yeah. But imagine it was like because of those 13, they're like, well, now you can't do nothing. Yeah, exactly. When you just done, like, looked at all these other ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, under, undeterred, Pico penned a uh, apologia defending them. <laughs> the apologia, J. Uh, Peachy Mirandal, Mirandalini, Concordi committees and it had published in 1489 dedicating it to his patron Lorenzo when the Pope learned of the dissemination of this manuscript he convened an inquisitorial uh, tribunal compelling Pico to disavow the Apologia and his condemned theses to which Pico reluctantly uh, acceded the Pope censored the 900 theses and uh, what he wrote um, when he censored it, in uh, part heretical, in part the flower of heresy, several are scandalous and offensive to pious ears. Most do nothing but reproduce the errors of pagan philosophers. Others are capable of inflaming the imperatives of the Jews. A number of them, finally, under the pretext of natural philosophy, favor arts, and they do say. They might have included magic, actually, in that. That are enemies to the Catholic faith and to the human race. This marked a significant turning point, as it was unprecedented for the church to impose a ban on a printed book, leading to the widespread destruction of nearly all existing copies. Fleeing to France in 1488, Pico faced further turmoil as he was apprehended by Philip II, Duke of Savoy, under the insistence of the papal, uh, of the papal resulting in his imprisonment at uh, Vincennes, or Vincennes. It was only through the intervention of uh, various Italian nobles orchestrated by Lorenzo di Medici that King Charles VIII secured Pico's release. Despite being granted a refugee in Florence under Lorenzo's safeguard, Pico remained under the shadow of papal condemnation and limitations until 1493, when the papacy passed into the hands of Alexander VI. The experience deeply shook Pico to his core. Despite the upheaval, he found solace in reconciling with Savonarola, a dear and steadfast companion. Pico's unwavering syncretist beliefs remain unaltered even as he played a pivotal role in bringing Savonarola to Florence at the behest of Lorenzo. Uh, Pico settled in a villa near Fiesole, a sanctuary thoughtfully arranged by Lorenzo. Uh, Pico devoted himself to profound literary endeavors. Uh, among his notable creations were the Heptaplus id s d di creatoris opere, 1489, okay. <laughs> in Di Ente et Uno, of Being and Unity, translation, in 1491. Notable, notably, he penned the powerful Disputations Adversus Astrologium Divine Catrium, whatever. Treatise against predictive astrology. I find that interesting. A scathing denouncement of the deterministic practices prevalent amongst astrologers in his era. Mm -hmm. Now, like, I, I can't necessarily, you know, I really don't know what he's getting at with all that. But I, I do think, and uh, it's something why, it's like, it's hard for me to get into a lot of, I guess, social media astrology. Uh, is that I do think there's also, like, people focus very much on the astrology and the effects of being in the flesh when I think there's astrology in a sense of coming out of the flesh 
I don't know how to, mm. any other way to explain it, but I, I do think astrology were very much focused on the most mundane in the flesh stuff where I think yeah. there is much more profound things to be talked about. Flesh. You know, I, 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 I feel like a lot of people also just like, oh, well, you know, I want to sleep around. I'm a Scorpio. It's okay. You know, it's like, you, I, just, I feel like yeah. it's also used as a crutch, honestly, for a lot of bullshit. Well, and how much, and this may be completely erroneous to say, but how much of the astrology that you associate yourself with being born is you should really look at the astrology of when you were conceived, mm. when your source energy was trapped into matter. Real right. Um, and be... so therefore, at that point, you could somewhat tangentially he, like with the astrology of outside the flesh so much being influential. Yeah. I don't know. That's a really good, it's pretty well thought. I'll be able to do it on the day of conception. Yeah. Uh, after the de death of Lorenzo di Medici in 1492, Pico moved to Ferrara, although he continued to visit Florence frequently. Due to uh, political instability in the city, the influence of Savonarola was on the rise. Uh, Savonarola opposed the expansion and style of the Renaissance, which had already caused conflicts with the Medici family, resulting in their expulsion from Florence and extensive destructions of uh, destruction of books and paintings. Uh, despite this, Pico became a devout follower of uh, Savonarola. He was determined to become a monk which led him to dismiss his previous interests in Egyptian and Chaldean texts. He destroyed his own property and gave away his entire fortune. Oh, wow. Isn't that some wild crap? All right, and now we're going to move on to uh, some of his other writings. Uh, here, I'll leave it up on the screen. I'm not going to try to read all this, especially with the way it's worded. I'm just going to keep screwing it up and have to edit the crap out of it. Um, if you want to look at it, you can. Um, the, this is the oration on the dignity of man. Uh, the oration not only acted as an introduction to Pico's 900 theses, but it also laid the foundation for what he considered a comprehen comprehensive framework for the pursuit of knowledge. Pico viewed these theses as a blueprint for humanity's progression of the hierarchy of existence. His 900 theses served as a prime illustration of humanist syncretism, as they uh, amalgamated various philosophical and mystical traditions such as Platonism, Neoplatonism, uh, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, and other stuff. Furthermore, they encompassed 72 theses outlining Pico's comprehensive system of physics. Uh, Pico's De Anime Immortalitate elaborated on the doctrine that man's possessions of an immortal soul emancipated him from hier hierarchical stasis. Pico advocated for universal uh, reconciliation, asserting in one of his 900 theses that a mortal sin of finite duration is not deserving of eternal, but only of temporal punishment. This particular thesis was deemed heretical by Pope Innocent VIII. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Can't, can't keep people scared for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the oration, the author represents a compelling argument articulated by Pierre César Bory, asserting that the human vocation uh, embodies a mystical essence that unfolds through a three-stage path. This path intrinsically encompasses moral metamorphosis, in intellectual exploration, and ultimate attunement with the absolute reality. Pico's strong opposition to astrology appears to originate primarily from the clash between astrology and Christian beliefs in free will. However, Pico's uh, reasoning went beyond Ficino's objections, despite Ficino being an astrologer himself. After Pico's passing, his nephew Giovanni Francesco, Pico di Mirandola, a devoted advocate of Savonarola, edited the manuscript for a publication. The editing may have intensified its critical stance, possibly shedding light on Ficino's fervent support for the manuscript prior to its release. Pico's uh, Heptaplus, a mystical allegorical exposition of the creation according 
to the seven biblical senses elaborates on his idea that different religions and traditions describe the same God. The book is written in uh, his characteristic, apologetic, and polemic style. And this is one thing that comes out of it. If they agree with us anywhere, we shall order the Hebrews to stand by the ancient traditions of their, father, of their fathers. If anywhere they disagree, then drawn up in Catholic legions, we shall make an attack upon them. In short, whatever we detect foreign to the truth of Gospels, we shall refute to the extent of our power. While whatever we find holy and true, we shall bear off from the synagogue as from a wrongful possessor to ourselves, the legitimate Israelites. Damn. Another notorious text by Pico uh, is De Omnibus Rebus. Ugh, I'm not going to read this whole thing. Of all things that exist and a little more, which is mentioned in some, entries, in some entries on Thomas More's Utopia and makes fun of the title Lucreatus de Rium Natura. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting to mention about this guy before we finally wrap it up, and I'm done showing all your ears off, uh, there is the Miranda Lament. The, uh, the Mirandola Mint is also known as the Mint of the Pico della Mirandola uh, and was the Mint of the Duchy of Mirandola. The activity of the Mint, which minted over 500 types of coins, began in Mirandola in 1515 and ended with the exile of the Pico family from the, uh, the Duchy of Mirandola in the early 18th century after the return of the Imperials following the French siege of Mirandola in 1705. Mm. The, uh, the Royal Coins, a collection of King Vittorio Emmanuel III, now housed in the National Roman Museum in Rome, and the collection in the Civic Museum of Mirandola are the largest collection of coins minted in the ancient state of Mirandola. And then here we have uh, some of the coins right there. And that's supposed to, I don't know, suppose that's supposed to be him on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then this I did find interesting. The shape of the city, Miranda in 18th yeah. century. I mean, that's a pretty interesting shape. That is a very interesting way to make a city. Yeah, I think so. For sure. And uh, that will wrap it up on my end. And... Uh, the people watching, if you haven't noticed, uh, some of us have switched rooms and uh, we've both changed clothes. Um, <laughs> we were having technical difficulties with the, the mic and some other stuff. And uh, we decided to finish this up the next day. But uh, I am done on my end. That is uh, enough out of me and Mr. Mirandola. And uh, now um, we are going to move on to Lisa, the one that she has to cover. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I love the headphones you Absolutely. got going on here. Hey, well, you know, I moonlight with uh, air traffic control, so I just, you know, <laughs> switch jobs. Yeah, but I'll tell you one thing. The mic sounds amazing, so who cares? Okay, good. <laughs> hopefully, yeah, hopefully this is the ticket. So, okay, well, good deal. Awesome. Um, so today I'm going to cover uh, Judah Lo Ben Bezael, and, of course, I'm going to massacre names. Everything's almost in Hebrew, so. Is he me. another Italian Jew, but, too, or no? I think he was yeah. German. Sorry, put you on the spot. No. <laughs> well, I don't think it's what a surprise. Yeah, I think he ends up in Italy at some point. You know, makes sense. Um, oh no, he was born in Poland. Okay, well, let me get there. Mm. Just a second. Sorry, screwing so you all Judah, up here, and putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, 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 you're totally fine. You're totally fine. Um, so Judah Lo Ben Bizael was born in 1512 and lived until September 17th, 1609. Another person that died on the 17th mm. of a month or 17th day of a month. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, the guy that I just covered in you and I, I, we didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> no, which is kind of odd. And so 17th is pretty popular. And September 17th is like, um, I think that it has some significance on it or whatever. But anyway, so he was an important Talmudic scholar, Jewish mystic, mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher serving as a leading rabbi in the cities of Mikulov, or in Moravia and Prague in Bohemia. To scholars of Judaism, Lo was known as Rabbi Lo, Maharal of Prague, or the Maharal. 
Loeb was a prolific writer and recognized for his work on Jewish philosophy and Jewish mysticism. In particular, he wrote a piece called Guru, Guru Arie Aha Torah. But more than his literature, he was recognized as the creator of the Golem of Prague, an animate fashioned from clay. Judah was born in Poznan, Poland. This is where he was born in Poland. <clears throat> to the Rabbi Biazel Lowe, whose family originated in the Rhinish town of Worms, Germany. Now, it seems like everybody's in Worms, either studying or being born there, or um, there's always a connection to Worms, Germany. Yeah, it's that was the, that, sorry, yeah, that's what I even, yeah. uh, that's right. I'm having flashbacks from yesterday. We did get a little bit into <laughs> into your part before we had problems. Yeah. And I think I even interrupted you till yesterday. Uh, again, Abramelon, uh, the Abramelon. I mean, yes. that's Abra Abraham from Worms. I, you know, he was from Worms, Germany, supposedly, anyway, too. Right. So that's interesting. Right. Something somebody, with Worms, Germany. And some of the saint occultists that we covered, I think, also did some time in Worms as well, or they studied there or something. That's come so up before. Be, it definitely has come up before, and yeah. then Germany is a constant, anyway. Mm -hmm. It is claimed that he came from nobility and that Judah's grandfather, Chaim of Worms, was the grandson of Judah Lape the Elder, linking him to the house of David. So there's a Davidic line supposedly going through um, Judah's family. There's two discrepancies with Judah in his life history. Um, it's possibly due, so in um, the Holy Roman Empire, Judah is documented to have been born in Worms, but I think this is because all his family was born in Worms. But he, historically, according to the claims, is that he was born in Poland. Um, and the second one was that there's a discrepancy with his birth year. A lot of places that I read was 1512, but there's other sites that say, no, it's 1520 or 1526. So, Oh, there's, one of the, there's even people that I've come across where it's like the year that they were born, it's like they don't even give it. Sometimes they'll give it like a, a – or the year, or they won't even give the month and the day because they're not sure. Or right. I've seen people with like it could be 81 or 82. I mean, honestly, right. when you start going back so far, I mean, how do, how do you even I, I will say that. That's true. That? Nobody was documenting, you know – who was being born when or whatever, but it does seem, you're right. It does seem that there's more documentation on people's death versus their birth. So maybe it's a tombstone thing, but um, so there's a bit of a legend with his birth. Um, so in 16th century, the Jews in this area, especially Poland were being accused of blood libel. And I'll talk about this a little bit more when we go into the Golem um, theory or the Golem uh, history. And they were being persecuted because they were believed to participate in a barbarous behavior where it is said that the Jews would kidnap children from Christians or Christian children to bake matzah for Passover with their blood. The accusation led to deadly ritual of pogroms, pogroms against the Jews that would erupt throughout the city, especially around the time of Passover, because that's when it was associated so on this particular night, um, Lowe's mom was going into labor, and she was having labor pains, and I believe she was running into complications. So guests leave the house to look for a midwife or to seek help or whatever. And when they go outside, they run into, I guess, like a perpetrator or whatever. And he was carrying a sack or a bag with the body of a dead child. And it had been said in, in the legend that what they believed was that people were kidnapping these Gentile children, killing them, and then planting them in the Jewish neighborhoods to, I guess, basically associate them or accuse them of this whole blood libel. This is according to what most of these websites were saying on the legend for low. So when everyone left the house to go look for a midwife or look for help with Lowe's mom, who was going into labor with Lowe, um, they found Every time you say that, I keep thinking of like, you know how many companies there are with Lowe's? I mean, besides, like, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, like, a lot of major companies that actually do have that name. <laughs> Every time yeah. you say it, I keep thinking of these companies. Yeah, and, you know, and apparently it's a Jewish, it's a German name. I didn't, I, I thought it was a Jewish name, but. Well, I see, I now that, I mean, that could maybe come from, again, if the parents were from Germany. Yes, yes, this is true. They were German yeah. Jews. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> um <laughs> So they, they find this guy, uh, the night watchman finds him, they arrest him, and they find out that he's carrying a bag with a dead child, and therefore this particular Passover, Jews were not subjected to pogroms, and therefore when Lo is born, he is already coined 
the savior of the Jewish people. So right at, of course, this is legend, right? But right at the start of his birth life, he's already destined for to be the savior of the people. Mm. So the um, name Lo, as we were just talking right now, is derived from the German word Lo, meaning lion, which is somewhat of a substitute name for the Hebrew name Judah or Yehuda, in which the biblical Judah was likened to lion in Genesis 49, 9. Commonly seen in Jewish naming tradition is that a Hebrew name will be paired with a substitute name, and that this is the case with Judah and Lo. So Judah associated with the lion, and then Lo, meaning lion, in German, are paired together. And you see him kind of capitalize on this when he wrote his uh, famous work, Ur Arie, um, a Torah, that it translates to young lion commenting upon the Torah. So he capitalizes on uh, that pairing of the lion. You know, it's interesting name. you're mentioning like lion and Judah, because, you know, there is mm-hmm. the, the lion of Judah. Um, one mm-hmm. of Crowley's, I think Crowley's lust card looks a lot like that. I could be wrong about the, which card. And, um, you know, I have mentioned that when Italy invaded Ethiopia, they did take their obelisk and their lion of Judah with them. Oh, interesting. Yeah, well, me and Teresa covered Italy, and, you know, mm-hmm. all of the crazy shit that they've done. That was one of the things. When they went into Ethiopia, they took an obelisk and they took the Lion of Judah. That seems such an odd thing to take. Well, because it's occult artifacts. That's why. <laughs> right. No, no, no. I know. But it just, of course they took it. But you know what I mean? Yeah, like just, yeah, yeah. For, for the, re, for the, from the way you have, you know, or we have been looking at politics and the history, that would seem mm-hmm. weird. Yes. 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 <laughs> But when you understand what the what the hell is probably really going on, you're like, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Well, it's a it's a cue in, right, mm-hmm. of what they were thinking at the time. So it is said that Judah, at the age of 12, went to a yeshiva in Poland and studied under Rabbi Yaakov Pollock. <clears throat> so yeshivas are traditional Jewish what was educational his institutions. Pollock? Pollock. P-O-L-L-A-K. Oh, Pollock. Okay. Luck. Yeah, I was like, it oh, reminds me of um, so they like call Polish my, people that sometimes back. In yes, the day. and well, that's what I was going to say. My great great grandmother was Polish, and they used to call her the Polak. Yeah, yeah. In Spanish, that's what they call her, la Polaka. So the yeshivas are traditional Jewish educational institutions that are focused on rabbinic literature, primarily the Talmud and Halakha, which is Jewish law, Torah, Jewish philosophy, and the like. So this involves lectures and classes. And then it also involves studying in pairs, which is a unique feature of yeshiva. So it's not only just sitting in a classroom and listening, but you also are paired up with someone and you study with them for a while, whether it's two years, 30 years, or what have you, or I think until they get married. And obviously, historically, these were only meant for men. Jacob, um, Jacob Jacob Polak was the founder of the Polish method of the Talmudic study known as Pilpul. Um, Judah was a student, and he became very vocal against this form of study. He went on to say it would be better to learn carpentry or another trade or to sharpen the mind by playing chess. At least they would not engage in falsehood, which then spills over in, from theory into practice. So he was very, very outspoken about that, apparently quoted a lot against this oh, practice. I, 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 even when you were telling me that, I was like, it could be a good thing or like, I don't know, it may not be the best thing either. Well, I wonder if he had a bad experience. Well, like, you, all right, if you think about it, if you're, you're playing chess with somebody, it's like you both have your ways of doing it and how you understand it, and you're just going against each other. Yeah. With this, you're kind of, like, learning, you know what I'm saying? You're, or influenced by somebody else's thought, or, you know, opinion on something. I think that's, I think there's a whole lot to that, in that they're not teaching you how to think, they're telling you how, what to think. You have two you people telling I mean? each other how to think. Exactly. Yeah. So then uh, Pollock leaves Poland. I think he runs into some trouble, and Lo is left wandering from place to place in about for about two or three years. Now, remember, Judah's like only 12 years old at this point. And again, I think we talked about this in, in the beginning of this episode, is that at the age of 10 and 12, like these people had already done so much or were already on to big things so that uh, by the time they're 20, they've accomplished so much. Um, so... When he's left to wander, he ends up going to another yeshiva in Poland, and this is where he comes across um, another student of Pollock and starts studying under him. Now, the important part of this is that he's paired with um, 
uh, what's it called? The guy that goes by the nickname Maharashal, Maharashal, and this is Maharashal and Rima, and those two go on to be, you know, pretty famous in um, Jewish and Talmudic studies. Maharashal had a student, and you talked about this, Elijah Baal Shem of Kalem, and he's another one that created a golem that just like Judah, but this one's a little bit later. And he is recorded as the first person known by the epithet Baal Shem. And I think is responsible for writing the Baal Tov. Remember you covered, um, I think, a grimoire? Yes, yes. So they're associated with that. And then Rema was also, and those these two are both Ashkenazi Jews or Ashkenazi rabbi, rabbis I, who are I Jewish. For some reason well. I can't remember... I think that sounds familiar too. Ashkenazi. Yeah, one of us mentioning somebody like that before in the past, possibly. I know that a lot of people have said something about Ashkenazi Jews having some sort of sinister backgrounds or something like that. So it, that pinged in my head that I was like, oh, I probably need to look into this further. Yeah, some people um, think that's like the answer to everything too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're the fall guys. Um, Especially when it's the goes, first time you heard about them. Oh, that's definitely going to oh, be the answer. No, that's definitely it. Yeah. They're the, yeah, yeah. It's the, yeah, the devil. It's the devil to everything. Um, so he goes on to study Nystar and Nigle, and those are both Torah studies. Um, he doesn't say which rabbi was responsible for teaching him this, but it was common in Yeshiva's to be taught the these two concepts and basically negle is the obvious revealed miracle and the revealed aspects of the torah where nine star is the hidden mystical miracle and the inner dimensions of the torah so he learned both of these and to me being a novice it seemed really odd that every time i looked up judah they kept mentioning these two concepts so i included them course me myself i'm thinking okay well this has to be something important i think this plays into um where the whole uh concept of him creating the golem comes into play later on so after studying and everything judah married his wife pearl and they go on to have six daughters and one son now pearl herself apparently was also because none of these schools allowed women but she had independently been studying the Torah herself, and I think she was also considered a Talmudic scholar just of her own accord, and that apparently she edited all his work, that whenever uh, Judah would write something, he would dictate it to her, and she would write it all down, and she would edit it and correct it and what have you. So she was very integral into all his work and made sure everything was correct and what have you. So that was also mentioned how she was um, pretty much a, a like his right hand with all of this. Hmm. So um, in 1553, he accepted a rabbi position in Moravia, and he was in charge of directing community affairs, determining which part of the Talmud was to be studied, and, um, and, and then at his location, basically saying, this is, this is the sections of the Torah that need to be, um, I guess, studied as well as reviewed. He went on to uh, revise the taxation process in the community as well as be involved in the community statues of elections. It was so influential that even after he retired, they continued or they considered him an authority and what he had said about the taxation and the elections from then on. And I, he retired in 1588 at 68. In 1583, he was also involved in rallying against the slanderous slurs on the legitimacy of certain families that could ruin, and it ended up ruining and preventing certain individuals of families to get married because of the slanderous slurs. Um, and what would ended up happening is that those children would never get married or they were basically cast out or they would not go on to have a family because of the, the slanderous slurs get made against the family. His family was also subjected to this situation. Um, and that whenever he would have his sermons, he was very open in public about denouncing these things. Um, he moves then to Prague in 1588 when he retires and he continues that campaign to be vocal against some of these slanderous slurs on the legitimacy of these certain families. On the 23rd of February of 1592, he captures the audience of Emperor Rudolf II, who was a patron of mystics and occult sciences. Um, 
I, we mentioned uh, Emperor Rudolph II in the Michael Meyer series. Um, basically, he was the one that had the highest respect for Meyer. He gave him this elevated position, gave him a title and what have you. Um, he was also um, a patron of Tycho Brahe as well as Johannes Kepler. So he was taking in all of these scientists, all of these mystics, all of these occultists, and, and basically, I guess, being a patron to them. Um, it is said that Rudolph II uh, basically engaged in a conversation with Judah about the Kabbalah because he had such a fascin the emperor had such a fascination for it. So it must have been, you know, the time to be in his court. He, all these people were coming in and out of there. That's that's uh, um, that's wild. That uh, all of them. Are, that's it's pretty cool that you mentioned uh, Tycho. What, what was his name again? I, Tycho, Tycho, Brock Tycho or yeah, Tycho, yeah, Brocke or something. Yeah, Tycho Brock or whatever. Yeah, he's uh, somebody I would actually like to cover myself too at some point. Yes, and you know, I I, I kind of clicked on his stuff just because you had mentioned him or whatever, and I had no idea. But Tycho Brock, like Johann Kepler, was his assistant and all of Kepler's laws that he came up with were based off of Tycho's data. So Tycho had to have been sort of a, a big deal back in the day. So, yeah, actually, you know, uh, it's funny. Somebody, uh, somebody has their own show uh, that, that hit me up too, because uh, I had made a uh, quote by Kepler a few days ago. Okay. And then I ended up doing a Tycho one a few days after that, because they had even reminded me, they, uh, they're like, you know, uh, Kepler stole, uh, basically stole Tycho's stuff. Yeah. But the thing is, is that I thought they were actually had opposing opinions. They did. They did. And I think what happened was that because he was employed by Tycho, he didn't want to speak out against his employer, but he was writing pieces that were in direct, stark contradiction. I don't know if that makes any sense. And then I think Tycho, he was like the last astro like serious astronomer before the invention of the telescope. Like I think so he all did of his question what those things were out there. Yes. Like, yeah. I'm almost positive he may not have thought they were solid. Right. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Because of based on what he said. Um, so numerous philosophical works by Lowe have become cornerstones of Jewish thought, and they are considered some of the most creative and original systems of thought developed in Eastern European Jewry, which um, they're held in such high regard in that sense. His writings would use rationalist terminology and classical philosophical ideas with supporting scientific re research, but only up to the point that it didn't contradict revelation. So he had a, he had a hard line on that one. He drew a line with, with the scientific research on that one, a constant object for Lowe, And as revealed in his work was to show how earlier literature was in fact, full of insightful commentary on humanity, nature, holiness, and the like. He showed that despite the multitude of disconnected opinions and perspectives, it demonstrated the diversity of meanings that can be extracted from a single idea or concept rather than a disjointed, disjointed literature. And I thought this was really cool because he basically took two pieces of literature or different lit literatures in themselves that appeared to be in stark contradiction to each other. And he's saying, no, they're basically, they, they, they're saying almost the same thing. They just have a diversity of, that the that concept has such a diversity of meaning, you can extract so many different perspectives and dimensions from it. And I thought that's pretty interesting and insightful for him to, to even recognize something yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, uh, yeah. something I, I, I did want to say too, I'm pretty sure Rudolf, this is Rudolf II, correct? Yes, Emperor Rudolf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he also did own the Voynich at one point. Oh, <gasps> yes, he did. That's right. Yeah. He did. So, I mean, he was definitely open to this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, he, I think he even, is, you know, I could be wrong, but, like, he may even have associated with, uh, like, John D. Yeah, no, he got it. it. He got the voynich from John D. Oh, wow. Yeah. So then they kept, they kept audiences with each other. You know what I mean? Like, he, paid they were all. He paid 600 gold ducats manuscript wow hmm. this That's is interesting, interesting how a lot of these people all intermingle mm -hmm. you know with occultists <laughs> yeah and how and all these occultists like all these... intermingle yeah exactly and it's i bet you it's a small community 
Well, I you know even I mean? think and some those, people were just like even just trying to learn from other people too. Agreed. What's your experience? I think you would, knowing what we know and looking at other people, looking back at polymaths, in that if you didn't know about occult, occult sciences or mysticism, you didn't know everything. Like you, you, you were, you were cutting yourself off in terms of learning another um, field of study. So. Um, okay, so back to Lowe. Lowe developed a comprehensive philosophical system with an accompanying terminology through literary and conceptual analysis of both biblical verses and recorded traditions of the rabbis. So he starts to develop his own terminology based on his concepts. And so stuff like um, order, transcendence, body, life force, intellect, bases, mixtures, combinations, he's developing all of these terminologies to kind of uh, discuss it and talk about them and define it himself. Um, an example of this terminology is Lowe's philosophical interpretation of the following midrash. The world was created for three things, Chala, Maser, and Bikram. I think that's how you say it. So with that midrash, according to Lowe, Bikram, which represents Yesod, um, is an individual fruit that is given. Maser represents Taravot, as the fruit that is gathered together and a fraction of them separated as a tithe, tith, tithe. And chala represents the tarkavot as a substance, new, a new substance such as dough that's created from those ingredients. So he basically what they're saying is that he would take one sentence from something of uh, Talmud or the Bible or whatever, and then he would show how it was allegorical and could explain all these different things. So that's weird that he has you, you well, you sewed it and whatever you sewed itself is a sphere on the Kabbalah. That's the moon. And when I looked it up, it keeps showing me a picture of a pomegranate. Like when I would Google it, yeah, which I, mean, I thought was interesting because you know, pomegranates are yeah, you associated have with a lot of Israel regarding in the pomegranate book. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and that's even so something that I even wondered if I went back into, you know, not to bring it up with the eyeball stuff. You know, if the pomegranates were kind of like something that had to do with like the vitreous nerves. I would think so. Yeah. Um, Just like even going by like some pictures that I think we've even looked at. I was like, I could see how you could say like that's resembling mm -hmm. of like seeds in a pomegranate or something with a lot of well, seeds. Well, and I think it. some of the nutrients or the micronutrients in pomegranates help with eye vision. Because I remember you mentioning pomegranates and thinking, oh, wait, I think there, there, ec there are uh, ingredients or extracts in um, pomegranates that, ha that help with uh, vision and retinal health and stuff. So, so on Lowe's worldviews, he assumes that, and if this starts to play into him leading up to the golem thing. Lowe's worldview assumes that reality consists of a single cause. There's no room for randomness in reality, which would indicate an absence of omnipotence or omniscience in the cause. The uniform caused nature of reality, the uniform caused nature of reality also indicates the existence of moral order in the world. And science can describe the phenomena in the world, but it cannot create a preference for one over the other such as a moral preference, must come from a higher order of the Torah, which Lowe calls a higher intellect. So um, Lowe emphasized the value of honesty and being straightforward, and it led him to criticize the uh, pill pool, which was um, that type of learning from Pollock, and that he suggested avoid learning commentaries until one has reached an advanced level of understanding. And it almost, it reminds me of the things that you say, like in terms that you, not everybody should know this stuff. And I think you have to go through some like an alchemical mental and spiritual journey before you start to absorb and learn and read some of these works. Um, I mean, you can read them I'm no one's saying not to, but it just to fully grasp them and understand them. I think. Yeah. I think it would you need be about mental maturity. that. And like, I just think, you know, it does help to actually uh, get your head right, you know, before you, Start, you know, messing with certain things. Yeah, you'll have a, yeah. you'll have a, think a better experience, a more right. of an understanding. But he was also uh, a critic of the Kabbalistic concepts such as of holiness of sexuality, 
and correspondence of the spiritual and physical worlds. Um, not to say he was against them, but he was just a critic of them. And I wonder if it was more of like the practice or who was saying what at the time, I think, at that at that whole thing. Because he was considered a Jewish mystic. And so for him to come out criticizing, to me, indicates that he was probably just being critical of what those other scholars were saying about it in and of itself. Um, so he is also credited for that, well, most of his work basically led to the concept of Hasidic Judaism, which was a type of Judaism that develops in Poland. Um, and it represents the constant striving for an intimate give and take relationship with God at every moment of human life. It's founded by Rabbi Israel Ben Eliezer, who is also Baal Shem Tov, or was associated with that. And, and this kind of started because they, a lot of people felt that Judaism had turned too academic and that it had abandoned the mystical. And so the Hadistic Judaism basically corrects that issue in that uh, the Baal Shem Tov brings that mysticism back into Judaism. Um, so that's that all, all of that is uh, one of those um, he's accredited with. So going back to Tycho Bra or Bray or whatever, um, apparently he was also in contact with him as well, as according to some of the scholars, um, that he held audiences with him and the, they were just in contact, him and, an, mm -hmm. him and one of his other students. So there's, you know, that connection as well. Um, quickly, the legend on him, and then, you know, I'll get into the golem. Basically, his tomb, um, it contains uh, a lion theme for his name and the substitute name, and it's decorated with a shield containing a lion, and it has two intertwining tails, which is a tribute to Bohemia, whose coat of arms is the uh, two-tailed lion. Um, the the whole golem or the, the uh, legend of the golem, whatever, it has inspired lots of books, um, so a lot of people attribute that to him. It's himself. There's um, a movie. Like I, there's a movie I suggest. It came out I think 2018 called The Golem. Might be on Netflix. I suggest people watch it. Oh, I've never heard of that. It was pretty I interesting. You were say about the Golem book because, yeah. like, I had known, you know, about that. What a Golem was, besides, you know, something in uh, what, what was that? Uh, the Hobbit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, besides yeah. that, I, I had heard of what that was. And I was actually just surprised that when they, sh in the movie, from what I remember, um, I was a little surprised, like, how kind of, like, accurate it was, where it was, like, taking, it was, like, a Jewish community. And, like, mm -hmm. men were, like, learning about the Kabbalah, why the women weren't allowed to, and they had to, you know, stick to their wifely duties as the husbands got educated on the Kabbalah. And, like, right. you know, that's, <laughs> but it was, I, I think, like, some of it was actually really interesting and maybe, like, a little bit on point with the golem and how it, you know, is associated with the uh, Kabbalah. Yeah. You know? And it's funny thing and is that it ends up being a chick who was just like, kind of like, screw you. I should be able to learn too. That ends up, I think, yeah. creating the thing. Yeah, no, exactly. That's funny. I'll have to check that out. Um, so this is his tomb and um, it's uh, still located in the Czech Republic. Um and there is a statue of Judah Lowe in Prague that stands in Prague. There was like coins put out of him and stamps and what have you. Like there's just so much, um, so much attributed to him in a sense. So the golem, uh, the creation of the golem was a legend that Lowe had become famous for. It's a creature made out of clay to defend the Jews of Prague of the Prague ghetto from anti-Semitic attacks, particularly the blood libel, which you mentioned a little while ago. It is said that Lowe used mystical powers based on the esoteric knowledge of how God created Adam. Others claim the golem was created by use of magical powers derived from the Kabbalah, which you just said. So just a little quick definition of blood libel, because I didn't know what blood libel was. It is the ritual murder libel or blood accusation that is considered anti-Semitic um, which was based on a false accusation. This is their definition. False accusation of Jews murdering Christians in order to use their blood in the performance of a religious ritual. This practice purports or echoes very old myths of secret cultic practices. And you see this everywhere from like South America, Central America, old Europe. I mean, it's not just specifically this area, but it 
was basically saying that it's a continuation of the archaic uh, child sacrificing. Um, so cultic practices, uh, when searching for the definition of this, it leads back to descriptions of ritual child sacrifice in antiquity or prehistoric societies. The claim of blood libel practice was leveled against the Jews, claiming the Jews required the human blood for making matzos and the unleavened uh, flatbread eat during Passover. Um, these accusations would often assert that the blood of Christian children was especially coveted and that blood libels served as the impetus for the creation of the golem of Prague to protect them from the pogroms. So you go on to the cultic practices and it's reminiscent of like Abraham and Isaac, because what they're saying is like the child sacrifice, the ritualistic killing of the actual children themselves, there is what they believe an extreme extension of the idea that the more important the object is, the more devout the person is. And I think you mentioned something like this when we were talking about smiley face killers with JJ, that it's like, what if it is a ritual to sacrifice your firstborn or your bestborn or something mm. like that? And you give your very best in an altar sacrifice, right? You don't ever give the gods your worst, you give the best, right? And so the firstborn, especially the first boy, would indicate you know the, the greatest possession of your family. Right. Uh -huh. And so it would be something of of that to that extent. Okay. Anyway, about that. And those are all those definitions. I didn't know what they were and I thought I'd share. You know what that, so that, a collection that did make me think though with uh, the golem. Um I mean I know this is like a little off, but like because you mentioned, you know, about having blood in it. I mean I guess people wouldn't realize unless they ever saw a cake of light. Okay. But, like, sometimes it can be, depending on how much they cook it, very clay-like. You know, and that oh. does have blood in it, and you're then ingesting it. Oh. It's just, you know, I, I don't know. I found that interesting. Like, as you were talking about it, I'm, like, thinking of something clay with then blood in it. I'm, like, oh, it's, like, so I've had a couple of cakes of light that might have been a little, so, like, wonder, you know, Well, and -like. isn't it reminiscent of the Last Supper? You know, when, when Jesus is sitting at the table and he says, take of my body, this is my bread I offer you, you know, when you break bread, think of me, what have you. And it was to emulate a blood sacrifice. I mean, and I, I do think, Crowley, I could be wrong, I do think, you know, I, again, depending on how this was all meant, or this could literally just be as it is, I'm pretty sure he does say, like, the best blood um, you know, it does suggest menstrual blood, but I think he says, but the best would be of a child. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, it's almost like, honestly, sounds like you're ingesting a gun. That's weird. Yeah, I'm probably it's, just it's like thinking too much in it, but I don't know. It just yeah. Came and popped into my head. Yeah. But, you know, going back to some of this um, theory with, you know, not to dwell on this by no means, but the whole child sacrifice thing is the idea of, of, the, the blood being so coveted from children or Christian children. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact of their innocence or how, how close to source they are versus, you know, what have you, which is, I would even, you know, interesting. this as simple thing as, you know, again, a lot of people don't think of it this way. Cause I just think they assume that people didn't know much back in the day, but could there literally be something to do scientific? Hate to even mm -hmm. use that just with the blood of a younger child. Is yeah. there something different in it, higher levels of something? Right. But then again, it's like yeah. now if you're ingesting it, I mean, well, what is yeah, your body you going to absorb anyway besides the iron? Yeah, it would. That that's it. That's pretty so, much uh, it. Yeah, um, I, just, I mean, but then again. Because who, once who it knows? hits your stomach acids, it pretty much is neutralized except for the iron. Um, but it also made me think of Star Wars, the Metachlorians. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, they were there. There's something coveted. There's something, in, yeah, there's in something the, in, a, there's some sort of level of something in the blood that will show, I guess, more prone uh, occult effects or, you know, it makes them more, I guess, of yeah. a, a natural magician, really, if you think about it. Or if you're trying, if you're trying to be, what is it, um, uh, what is it, hygienic, and that you know a child's going to have less diseases than an older person, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's just that. But, oh, no, but I'm talking about, like, um, the whole thing with the levels in the blood, like you were talking about no, no, Star no, Wars. No, no, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. But, um, so according to legend, the Jews in Prague were being persecuted by the Christians, which I just covered a little while ago, um, for this whole blood libel. Oh, and there was another um, thing, I'm sorry, I, I forgot because no, I was ahead, going go on with that, but even, um, 
even the way you were kind of explaining the blood libel, like I, I'm wondering if there was any idea behind that kind of with, and this again is if how truthful this is, if the Shriner hats were really red because they were supposedly dipped in the blood of Christians. You know, that could that have been a ritualistic thing as well? And then is that why, you know, blood was used for that? Yeah. Well, and, and no matter what, um, what's it called? No matter what belief system, blood is revered. Blood is sacred. And blood is extremely, um, from the children, is like at least in Central America, like with the Mayans and Aztecs, you know, with their ritual sacrifices, they cov- they held child blood to be the highest as I, well. I mean, again, like so, I said before, I do think there is something up with something in your blood that will change or is used during magic. So, I mean, I think so too. So I do st- I definitely think there's something up with that. Yeah. I mean, again, like, and, and I, I forget who it was and I'm sure the guy was probably accurate. You know, David Icke would go on about like reptilian people, but he would, you know, go on about like one person that like would fly or travel with bags of blood. Again, Oh. That would make sense because you're doing it through IV. You will absorb whatever's in there if you're ingesting it. You, I mean, you're gonna have to. You're gonna drink a ton of it and eventually get poisoned from iron. Yeah, iron poison. Well, I mean, I, you're like, not gonna get anything out of it. Man. Maybe the shits. Even I don't know. Ath- even athletes do blood doping, where they travel with blood and they, you know, but it's through use IV. fresh blood or whatever to to basically recover from what or have a faster recovery. Yeah. So. Um, so some of these persecutors, as we mentioned earlier, would sneak into these Jewish ghettos and deposit the body of a child in the street to an attempt to incite people against the Jews. So the Maharal or Judah Lo, always devoted to the welfare of his people, prayed for a vision to tell him how to stop these false accusations and claimed to be told by heaven to make a human image of clay. The rabbi took his son-in-law and his favorite student down to the river and formed the shape of a man from clay. They each walked around the figure several times in certain amount of, yeah, in certain amount of times, and then recited a Kabbalistic formula, and the golem was brought to life. It appeared as a man in his 30s, and the rabbi clothed the golem and named him Joseph. Through the use of the talisman, the golem would appear invisible and was sent out to stop anyone carrying a large parcel. Remember, the guy was carrying like a bag or whatever. Um, when a person was found intending to deposit the body of a dead child in the Jewish streets, a golem would tie up both the offender and the evidence and carry them both to the authorities. Once the blood libel was declared to be groundless and persecutions were forbidden, Rabbi Lo removed the breath of life from the golem by walking around the figure the same amount of times and repeating the words in reverse order, which reminded me of the whole Crowley thing of the reverse or Alice in Wonderland, the whole backwards thing. In other versions of the story, the golem becomes uncontrollable, almost like a Frankenstein monster, wreaking havoc on the community or the entire city, attacking both Jews, Gentiles, and even the Rabbi Lo himself. Other variations of the story say that the word truth was put on the golem's forehead to animate it, and then to return the golem to a lump of clay, the first letter was erased, thus spelling death. So it's which, you know, that reminded me of when we do the gematria and we take out a word or run it yeah. to see what the um, what the power is with removing or keeping a word. So in Jewish folklore, the golem means raw material, um, inanimate being made entirely from inanimate matter and given life through mystical process involving the secret name of God. Most well-known golem was this one that Judah created And it was in 1580 when the legend said that it was created and it was obviously done for protection. And apparently it is um, only, it's understood to be a process that only those closest to God can do that. And that if a golem was to be created for not the purpose of uh, like beneficial or some benevolence, then it wouldn't happen or that God wouldn't allow for the golem to be created the golem themselves were generally mute they wouldn't be able to speak because according to legend they don't have a soul because it was created by man it wasn't created by god it had no free will and it always had to obey its maker so i thought that was pretty interesting that the distinction between that creation versus the creation that was made from god so the origins of the golem come from the sefer yetzerah 
the Book of Formation, a Kabbalistic text that deals with the process of creation of the universe. The Hebrew word golem has interpreted has been interpreted in multiple ways, like in the Bible, as well as the Semitic literature, referred to it as embryonic or an incomplete substance. Uh, commentaries on the Mishnah, specifically um, a certain section of it, a term referred to is now used as a term referred to people whose behavior is unbalanced or uncultivated. They're not learned or wise, and I think now it means like stupid, clumsy, and inconsiderate. So it's kind of been bastardized throughout the time. But um, just to kind of give you a little bit like Golem and where it comes from, like Adam, all Golems are created from mud. They were all they were a creation of those who were very holy and close to God, striving to approach God, and in the pursuit gaining some of God's wisdom and power. One of these powers was a creation of life. No matter how holy a person became, however. A being created by that person would be put in a would be the shadow of that person versus one that's created by God. So that's pretty much that one, that whole legend of the golem. But um, so yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he's definitely hooked up with uh, the mm, right crew too. For sure. <laughs> yeah. So if you. <laughs> So if you go to Prague, apparently this statue is there, which I thought I found pretty interesting. Um, yeah, that whole thing with the golem is very interesting in itself. Mm-hmm. I think so too. I mean, like you were saying before, I mean, let's say this is even something that's like much deeper than this. And it's just like an allegory or whatever, but. Um, I do even think going by like the way that this the signs or the way that this is supposed to work, the way the magic works, you kind of mentioned it before, uh, you know, the the sounds, because I do think there's certain ways of actually different ways possibly with the golems, but like you're, you're supposed to be saying things and like almost breathing life into it. And again, to me, that would almost really go and prove more of the fact that there's energetic value to yeah. letters and words and what's yeah. being said. Yeah. And I think on some of these golem sites, like in terms of uh, like talking about it, they said that like the creation of a golem was the fir- was first seen as the initiatory mystical experience. I don't know if that has anything to do with like there are certain levels of, okay, you first have to create a golem first and then you can pass on to the next level. Um, to show kind of like, like um, not your worth, but your talent mm. with yeah, uh, mysticism. Even again, could that, again, could that be something that you'll understand what that means when you have a magical experience? And it, could it be actually different than the way most people are taking it? Yeah. And like you said, it could be allegorical. It That's could what I'm getting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. And it would make more sense, you know, and in a different you're way. you're thinking... Like an actual, you know, one way, and it's yeah. That somebody's problem. actually like making mud pies and bringing them to life, you know. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. And it, it sounded great with your uh, new oh, headset. Good. I'm glad. Yes. Yes. Um. So I guess I mean, well, I guess we'll wrap it up there. I think that's long enough between the both mm-hmm. of us. It's probably about an, an hour and a half. Um. Yeah. Uh, would you like to uh, let everybody know where they can uh, reach you at in case they want to get in touch with you? Sure. Um, Twitter at Solis Lisa or Instagram at Lisa Solis. Yes. And uh, like I said, by the time this comes out, I'm sure that the uh, ORI site will be up and running. Uh, check that out. Like I had even said at the beginning of the show, there will probably uh, be more stuff on there from Lisa than she has ever covered on the show. And there might even be some extra stuff that I've put up that, like, is a little bit more detailed that we even may have covered on the show or that I haven't done on the show. So uh, definitely check that out. And plus all the other amazing uh, people that are on there as well. Um, Yeah, that is the, uh, I guess that's the end of this one, The Occultists uh, Part 2. Um, I think we will be doing, like I mentioned uh, in the beginning of this one, we should probably be doing a grimoire too as well, mm-hmm. uh, covering a couple of more older uh, grimoires that maybe uh, just want to bring light to, you know, let people know that they exist and they, they like might have been important. You know, plus I just yeah. think, I honestly, I think that stuff is just so interesting. I do too. I 
I get so lost in learning the history of it, the yeah, content, yeah. you know, where it came um, from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what is it trying to get at the symbolism in there? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And just sometimes, honestly, looking at books that are that old, it just look pretty damn cool anyway. <laughs> I yeah. pretend I'm in the never ending story of finding yeah. a book I'm not supposed to read. And hopefully Falcor shows up. Just kidding. Fuck, I wish. <laughs> That'd be gangster. Uh, thank you very much. Uh yeah, definitely mm -hmm. thank you very much for, you know, going out, trying to fix the issue and coming back on oh, and, yeah, of course. and kicking ass like you normally do. I really appreciate it, Lisa. And uh yeah, that is the end of another uh cult rejects. And until the next one. Everybody be well. Later.